So now I'm very happy to welcome Sarah Sweden with us. Uh, she's a renowned independent front UI developer, author, educator and speaker from uh, Lebanon where she's joining us. Hey Sarah. Hey Veronica. Hey. Um, Sarah has been voted Developer of the Year by the NET Awards 2015 and has accumulated a whole array of other accolades uh, for her brilliant work on the web. Uh, she majored in computer science but actually is a declared autodidact, uh, having gained the knowledge of the web on the web and um, which really shows, I think, your, your kind of urge to learn and to really experiment and, and to forward the, um, the field which you find yourself. You, have, you are working for globally for, for many different clients, um, helping them build clean front end uh, foundations for their websites and, and applications and uh, with a very particular focus on accessibility, which is really great. Um, and but of course, also performance and and uh, progressive enhancements. And perhaps uh, we will hear a little bit about your special bonds uh, with birds in the interview now that okay. uh, Will <laughs> is led by Linda Kudanowska, who is joining us uh, from Prague today. Linda is an uh, editor, writer, and with a background in graphic design, history of art, and also cultural anthropology. Hi, Linda. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> um, <coughs> she's focusing on international design and typography related projects, books and magazine publishing. She's uh, chief editor of the Typo 365 Typo <coughs> edition and we very much look forward to volume three, <laughs> Stories on Type, the annual. She's also a hardcore traveler um, with over kind of 80 countries under her belt, um, at least uh, in non-pandemic times. And um, she's really the most prepared per person I know before a trip. I have the feeling um, always that she, she just prepares and checks out all the cultural sites uh, far away from any kind of tourist traps. So uh, yeah, I give over to you and uh, I look forward to this interview with Sarah. Thank you both. Thank you, Veronica. Hello, my favorite type people. Thank you very much for having us here. Um, I am, as Veronica said, I'm a journalist and I talk to people. Um, when I was asked to talk to Sarah Swaydan a few weeks ago, my first reaction was a very happy yes. But then I realized the true scope of Sarah's expertise and I understood that my <laughs> role tonight would be just to lean back and listen and learn. So, <laughs> hi Sarah. Hi Linda. <laughs> uh, we all struggle when explaining to our parents what we actually do for a living. And I imagine that um, someone like you may struggle even more. <laughs> um, how do you describe your mission when someone wants to know? First, I used to say that I build websites with an emphasis on building, not designing, because for a lot of people here, especially if they're not tech savvy, um, if you tell them that you make websites, they assume that you will be designing and developing and doing the whole package. Um, so there was that, but now, when I started leaning uh, or moving more towards accessibility, I started talking about it in a slightly different way. So I would say that I create the interfaces that, or not the interfaces, I use a more common word. Like I create the, the thing that you see on a website um, and I make sure that everybody is able to use it. So even if someone is blind and they're trying to use a website, they will be able to do that. And the reactions that I now get are completely different because a lot of people are like, really? like. Is that even possible? And I'm like, yes, it is very possible. Um, it is a little bit impressive to them, but sometimes they're like, 
ah, yeah, okay, so it's just websites. I've gotten used to that. <laughs> okay, but um, tonight we are here uh, mainly to talk typography. Um, what is the role of uh, typography in your work? Um, okay, so I, I, I'm going to answer this in two, from two different um, corners or points of views. The role of typography or our role when it comes to typography. Um, so when it comes to typography on the web, we, of course, just like everything else, we need to make sure that um, it is everything, all the content that we're creating is easily readable, um, understandable, and all that stuff. And in order to do that, we are the people that are, of course, we're the designers or we're the developer, we are going to influence whether that is possible whether that's going to happen or not. Um, so there are the typical things like we need to make sure that we're using colors, uh, suitable colors that are readable uh, with enough color contrast for accessibility. Um, the font sizes that we choose, make sure that the text is large enough, make sure that um, if someone is using mobile devices, they will be able to zoom in and zoom out, pinch to zoom. We because in development, sometimes one line of HTML might disable that, and that is a huge UX failure. Uh, we need to make sure that we choose uh, font units, for example, or sizing units that do not disable the user's um, ability to zoom in and out, because also that's going to affect accessibility. Um, in order to make sure that the typography is legible, there are so many aspects of it that we need to look into from a design and development uh, perspective. Uh, we need to make sure that the spacing is right, uh, following the WCAG guidelines when it comes to spacing between lines, um, uh, the, li the line length, the spaces between, between the lines, between the words, between the letters sometimes, uh, the typefaces that we choose, whether they're serifs or sans serifs, because um, some people have problems, uh, people with uh, dyslexia, they have problems differentiating the shapes of letters and some uh, some serif fonts make that even more difficult for them. Uh, so we try, one of the things that we can do and that we have, that we're more capable of doing today is providing the users with the ability to customize the interface. Uh, one, one way is to make sure that the default customization, such as zoom, zooming in and out, is not broken for them. And then we can even add an extra layer of customization using uh, things like variable fonts, for example. Um, they are really fantastic variable fonts because um, just like the name implies, they are variable. So we can offer the users the ability to change specific things about the about the font, such as the width of the letters, um, uh, the serif sizes. Uh, they can tweak like the serif sizes or uh, bowel shapes and size, ascender and descender lengths, and stuff like that. Uh, perhaps even fonts. Um, there are fonts that can increase the size of the width to improve legibility for older users who may have visual limitations, like cataracts. Conversely, also we can even uh, provide them the ability to decrease the width if someone is like if they have better vision. So we have a huge impact on typography, which in turn has an impact on um, readability, accessibility, all that stuff. Um, the Typetech audience consists mainly of uh, professionals in the creative industry. Uh, could you describe, say, three most common mistakes? that the web designers make and should avoid from the accessibility point of view so their cooperation with the web developers is as flawless as possible? OK. Um, so all of my work is typically with designers. I, I work on the, at the intersection of design and development. So most of my work is with designers. I'm lucky enough to usually be involved in projects early in the design process. But I would say that. Uh, this is a mistake that maybe teams make sometimes or organizations, not the designers themselves. But if the designer can change it, the, I would highly suggest or that they should. Um, the major thing, instead of naming three separate things, I would say that the main problem is not communicating with the developers as early in the design process as possible because um, developers have input. We are privy to implementation details that can shape the design. And uh, we literally can affect how the design is going to look and sometimes work. There are a lot of design patterns. Um, if you're going to implement like a navigation or um, any kind of pattern on the web, there are different ways that you can implement it. And we as developers, we have input that can help unify the experience between uh, mobile and desktop, for example, make sure that it's accessible. If there's a specific pattern that that poses certain problems, like when it comes to keyboard interactions or screen readers interactions, we can provide input that um, in order to avoid that. Um, 
So for example, I recently provided input for, uh, for a project that I'm currently working on where we're designing a navigation that of course needs to be um, responsive. So we have the mobile version, we have the desktop version. Visually speaking, they look very different, not only from a layer perspective, but also from styling and everything. But with the input that we were able to discuss when it comes to keyboard interactions and how a screen reader user is going to um, interact with it, we ended up with a we ended up by cha changing the pattern a little bit, changing the interaction and the way it was going to work because of that input and which results resulted in a more unified experience. Um, if I were to go into more details, I would say designers, for example, sometimes miss um, um, including focus styles because that is something that needs to be included, make sure that the focus styles are accessible as well, making sure that there's enough color contrast because I still see that a lot, uh, form elements, uh, using best practices for form elements and interactions, lots of stuff could be covered. Okay, um, you mentioned uh, responsibility and accessibility. Uh, could you perhaps explain what are the essential steps a good UX developer does to make their websites accessible and inclusive? Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to answer that focusing on the technical side because there's a lot of non-technical things that we could get into. Like for example, um, a developer needs first and foremost they need to care about the user. They need to have you need to have empathy. You need to want to make it accessible, etc. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on the technical stuff. Um, one thing that everybody should be doing probably is following the web content accessibility guidelines and whatever those guidelines try, uh, try to apply them because there are guidelines for uh, styling, like colors and contrasts, um, interactivity, keyboard navigation, um, uh, specific like patterns when you create interactive patterns, users typically, whether they are keyboard users or screen reader users, if they're interacting with a um, with a with an accordion, for example, or, or with tabs, a tabbed interface, they expect certain behavior. They expect to be able to navigate it using specific keyboard keys. So following the WCAG guidelines or um, authoring practices or, you know, all the, make sure that all the interactivity that the user expects, you're implementing that. And then there are also um, uh, learn, learn more about the users that you're going, that you're building for. So learn more about screen readers, try testing with them. Um, create a resilient foundation. This is, I think, one of the most fundamental things and also fairly simplest things that we can do is make sure that we're, we're building with semantics, um, the foundation of a truly accessible, resilient, future-friendly web is accessible H or semantic HTML because semantics are, they are a language that all the devices understand and will understand in the future. So you will be you will be building something that works for a user, no matter what device they are using or um, how they are browsing the web. And most of all, at the end of the day, it's always, always about the people that we're building for. So if you can talk to the people, talk to the users, test with them, uh, get feedback from them. If there is anything about your pattern or something that you're implementing that needs to be tweaked, there's no one better to tell you how to do it than the users themselves. Okay, and um, is there any like a life-changing phenomenon inside that you are you are already aware of, and we all should get ready for something like uh, SVG some ten years ago or something like that? So on the front end side, I would say one of the most exciting things that have been implemented already are things like layout mechanisms and CSS, like CSS Grid. But something that I'm personally super excited about that I have been waiting for for years is container queries, because container queries are going to make creating portable patterns easier, that we will be able to build patterns, hopefully, that are truly plug in and play. So you would place them anywhere in the layout, and they should work as you would expect them to but not entirely, because even if you have something that is um, perfectly designed, perfectly implemented using all the modern features like CSS variables, styles are contained within that element itself, perfect implementation, almost perfect. It's not, it doesn't end there. So say that you're building a design system, for example, and your design system includes a pattern library and all the patterns inside of that pattern library have been tested for um, interactivity, for accessibility. 
even then it's not done you're not really done then because at the end of the day context is always going to be key especially when it comes to accessibility so we can create those patterns but when it's time to implement them on a page it, like it doesn't end there it doesn't end when you build it you still have to test it after you implement it and there are still certain things about it that are going to change when you want to implement it like if you have a um a pattern that contains headings inside of it and you want to put that somewhere on the page you want to make sure that that heading has the appropriate level so that the um at the end of the day the heading structure of the entire page makes sense because that is important for screen reader users uh, so you need to determine context for th things like headings or if you have icons how are those icons going to be used do they need a label or are they just decoration and if they need a label what kind of label is it like does it describe what they are or what they say what they do and stuff like that so container queries are one of the most life-changing things that are going to happen for us um, but always something I always say at the end of the day it's us it's the people sometimes it's about the people that we're building for and sometimes it's us because we still have work to do okay and now for something completely different <laughs> uh your as veronica mentioned your list of clients from across the globe is rather impressive from netflix to khan academy etc but this brings along a huge cultural responsibility i imagine what is the role of cultural diversity in your work? Okay, so also there are also two ways that I could answer this. One of them is cultural diversity in the companies that I work with and how we work together, or there is the products that we're building. So I will once again focus on the product because at the end of the day, we are all there to build products for users. So I think this, I think what you mean is we're kind of touching on um, internationalization, you know, building products that work for different cultures. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay, so I believe that at the end of the day, internationalization of any product, digital product, is a business decision, right? So it is an effort something or something you undertake if you want to reach a wider audience, especially if you have local competitors in those specific markets that you're trying to reach. So when you're designing for a global audience, a lot of cultural differences need to be taken into account and integrated into the design and development of the product. Um, culture, something that we have learned over the years is that culture influences how humans interact with computers and with the, the, the digital products. So when you're designing for a multicultural audience, the challenge is to learn as much about each culture as possible to cater for it, just like you learn as much as you can before you travel. Um, so, and, and in order to make sure that your products are comprehensible to the people in those cultures using the native languages and symbols and currencies, for example, making sure that your interfaces are usable also in the native language and desirable, if that makes sense. On a more granular level, more technical level, there are specific issues to keep in mind, like uh, which characters to use, numeric and currency formats, telephones and addresses, because not everywhere the same addresses and address formats are used, names and titles, are you making sure that um, users, uh, people that have only two letters and their last names are actually considered? Because I've seen a lot of people, um, you know, when they're trying to use an interface and they enter the last name, which is could maybe, for example, be Ho, um, it's uh, the UI says that that's not a valid um, name, which is, you know, fail. Uh, you need to also make sure, you know, capitalization and punctuation, units of measure, which measures, uh, which units to use, because everybody knows that not everyone <laughs> uses the US system. Uh, there are also aesthetics, use of colors, shapes. White is happiness in some country. It's, it, is, it, um, it symbolizes death in another. Uh, and then there are cultural values, uh, values like notions of quality, normality, cleanliness. So it's definitely more challenging, but also more exciting to be building for cultural diversity. And um, there's so much, so much that we can learn, can do, and uh, should be learning and doing, maybe. Um, and since our time is almost up, um, I would like to ask you one last question. Uh, we can't pretend that we live in like a normal state of the universe, but um, I would say that we all have learned a lesson over the past year. Um, 
do you see any bright side of the pandemic for uh, for a freelancer? Have you learned anything like special about your work or even yourself that you would like to share with us? I've been a freelancer my entire career. So I started doing this in 2013 and I've been a freelancer since, but I think that one of the things that I really loved, I know it's weird to say this, but one of the things that I really loved about what's, what's happened, um, the shift, the way everything shifted and where every, all, all the work became uh, online and everyone was working from home, which has been kind of easy for some people and they started investing in home offices and they really liked that, but then it was a lot more difficult for other people. Something that I personally really appreciated is that everybody, people, we the people, we realized how lonely it can get without other people, even if we've been working from home all the time. So I've been doing this from home for like years, like I said, but I still somehow felt lonely and so did a lot of people. Am I cutting off? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so I would say the bright side is that people started finding more ways to connect because they can't see each other more in real life. So they started finding more ways to connect. Um, communication got better, I think, over like with all the tools and or the, all the, um, you know, trying to create a remote culture at a company that's not used to it. People started caring more about people and you, it's become more of, it's become so much easier to just get online. And if you have a baby and they come into your room while you're talking, that has been normalized. And I think that should have been normalized the entire, throughout the entire time, you know, I, that's what I like. Everything that has happened, even though it has obviously a super dark side, it's the human, you know, the human side, the need for other people. I really yeah. like that. Okay, I wish we could go like this um, for much longer, but unfortunately our time is really up. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this Over insights. Time. It was really uh, eye-opening for me. <laughs> I Thank hope you. to see you at the at the web, web Expo in June in Prague, should the should the pandemic allow. <laughs> uh, I think that's going. Yeah, hopefully, I hope so. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank. Thank you both. That was great, Sarah. You're like a bullet. You know, you 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 talk. <laughs> so fast and really wow no no it's it's great i mean you you explain the things uh very well so but wow okay very packed. thanks i guess <laughs> and um but i think linda you had the idea to do a longer interview at some point perhaps um publish publish it somewhere yeah we fun. have to we have to discuss this with sarah um <laughs> yeah a little longer <laughs> Because, because it yeah, we, we just touched it uh, slightly. <laughs> yeah, of course, there's plenty more to, to talk about. Okay, thank you very much, and we'll see you later at the panel. Thank you. Thank you.